So now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about anemias. First of all, what is the definition of anemia and how does it present? Anemia is defined as a low red blood cell count for a person's given age. People with anemias are usually fatigued and weak because their ability to deliver oxygen to their tissues is compromised. There are many different types of anemia and one way to classify them is by looking at the mean corpuscular volume of red blood cells, which is a measure of their average size. This is easily done in conjunction with a typical complete blood cell count, or CBC. We can then classify anemias as small, or microcytic, with an MCV less than 80, normal-sized, or normocytic, with an MCV between 80 and 100, or large, aka macrocytic, with an MCV greater than 100. Let's spend some time taking a closer look at all three types of anemias. In microcytic anemias, the RBCs are smaller than our normal RBCs. They are also hypochromic, hypo meaning low and chromic meaning color. So they have less of this red color that we normally see in our cells. In these cells, you'll notice a larger area of central pallor, as we see in this example. In this photograph, we can see a real smear of the pathology that we just depicted. In many of these cells, you will notice a large area of central pallor, and that many of these cells may appear to be smaller than some of their neighbors. Remember that the average RBC should be approximately the size of a lymphocyte. Many times the exam will give you a lymphocyte as a comparison to note that cells may be smaller or larger. Remember that hemoglobin is made up of two things, a heme group and a globin molecule. The heme group itself is also made up of two things, essentially the iron and protoporphyrin. Globin is a tetrameric protein, meaning that it has four parts, each containing a heme group. In utero, and soon after birth, hemoglobin F is the predominant form of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin F consists of two alpha globin chains and two gamma globin chains. After a few months, the production of the gamma subunits begins to decrease, and they are replaced by the beta subunits. This combination of two alpha and two beta subunits forms hemoglobin A, or the adult hemoglobin. The adult hemoglobin will be the predominant form of hemoglobin for the remainder of that person's life. There is also normally a small fraction of hemoglobin A2. Hemoglobin A2 consists of two alpha and two delta subunits. Lastly, there is normally a small component of hemoglobin A1C. Do you recall what makes hemoglobin A1C? This is basically a normal hemoglobin A that has had a glucose added in a process that happens naturally without an enzyme. This process is called a non-enzymatic glycosylation. If you have a normal amount of glucose in your blood, then you will have a normal amount of A1C. If you suffer from diabetes and have a large amount of glucose in your blood, then your hemoglobin A1C will directly correlate, and since hemoglobin lasts for about 120 days, we can use this hemoglobin A1C reading as a direct indicator of the average amount of blood sugar a person has had for the last three months, and not just at the time that the capillary blood glucose reading is taken. So microcytic anemias either arise from a problem of making heme or a problem of making globin. Globin issues would include alpha and beta thalassemias, and problems making heme may occur in situations such as iron deficiency. Iron deficiency is by far the most common cause of any microcytic anemia. So if on your exam you see small RBCs by blood smear, or a low hemoglobin, or an MCV less than 80 on CBC, be sure to think of iron deficiency first. Remember that the exam loves most common questions. With iron deficiency, if you're low on iron, then you're low on heme, and consequently, low on hemoglobin, and then bam, you've got a microcytic anemia. Other possibilities for abnormalities with heme might be lead poisoning or sideroblastic anemias. Iron deficiency can be caused by losing large amounts of iron while bleeding for a prolonged period of time. Think menorrhagia in women of childbearing age. 
what subunits make up the hemoglobin F and hemoglobin A molecules. Well, hemoglobin F is made up of two alpha and two gamma globin chains, and hemoglobin A is made up of two alpha and two beta globin chains. Now let's consider that you are given a patient under 50 years old who has melana and iron deficiency anemia. What do you think is the most common cause of this condition? Well, first recall that melana is black, tarry stool resulting from oxidized blood in the feces. This indicates that you have bleeding from somewhere in the upper GI system. And why would this occur? The most common cause of this is peptic ulcer disease. What if I said the patient was over 60 years old with hematochesia? In this case, you'd want to think about getting a colonoscopy because colon cancer moves up on your differential. Now other than losing iron, some physiologic states increase the demand for iron, like pregnancy. During pregnancy, a woman will increase her blood volume by 50% and her RBC mass by 33%, drastically increasing the demand for iron. So women are at risk of becoming iron deficient during pregnancy, which can lead to negative outcomes for both the mother and the fetus. One interesting manifestation of very severe iron deficiency is plumber vincent syndrome. plumber vincent syndrome consists of a triad of dysphagia from thin membranes in the esophagus called esophageal webs, atrophic glossitis appearing as a smooth glossy tongue, and iron deficiency anemia. On the boards, you might only be given information about the esophageal webs and the tongue and be asked what other symptom you suspect and would test for. The answer would be iron deficiency anemia. The thalassemias can also cause a microcytic anemia, but instead of having problems with heme, as we saw previously, these patients have mutations in the globin subunits of hemoglobin. What kinds of cells will show up on a peripheral smear with thalassemias? That would be the target cells that we see here. Not surprisingly, alpha thalassemia is a defect in the alpha globin gene. There are normally four copies of the alpha globin gene, two from mom and two from dad. The severity of disease is directly proportional to the number of mutated or defective genes in these four regions. One to two mutated genes will give you a relatively normal phenotype with no anemia. This is because there are still enough alpha units to join the beta subunits and form sufficient hemoglobin A. Since hemoglobin A can still be formed, these patients will have a normal hemoglobin electrophoresis. However, it is important to note the configuration of these mutated genes. Some patients will have a mutation in the cis configuration which means that two of these gene mutations are on the same chromosome and come from the same parent. If two patients with two mutations in cis configuration were to have a child together, even though mom and dad may have a normal phenotype, the child could potentially have no copies of the alpha globin gene, inheriting two mutations from both parents. We'll discuss the consequences of this abnormality later, but it's clearly not good. And what would having two mutations in trans mean? Well, two mutations in trans would mean that the patient would be missing two genes. However, here they are on opposite chromosomes, so one from mom and one from dad. Then a potential fetus would get one functioning gene and one mutated gene from both parents no matter what. When two patients with mutations in trans mate, a child would always have two mutations. But unlike having two parents in cis configuration, this child would have no risk of having all four copies with mutations. Now how could you have three mutated alpha globin genes? In order to have three mutations, one of your parents must give you two mutations in cis, and the third mutation must come from the other parent. This results in three alpha mutations. This disease is called hemoglobin H disease. Importantly, these patients will have some normal hemoglobin A from the one remaining normal alpha gene. 
because there are so few alpha globin subunits around, beta globin units start forming homotetramers, known as hemoglobin H. Importantly, these patients will have some normal hemoglobin A from the one normal alpha globin gene. Also importantly, these patients can be diagnosed with an abnormal hemoglobin electrophoresis. This is because hemoglobin H will have a different charge than hemoglobin A. These two proteins, with different charges, will separate differently on an electrophoresis gel, demonstrating both hemoglobin A and hemoglobin H in a patient with hemoglobin H disease. What would happen with four mutated alpha globin genes? Well, with four mutated alpha globin genes, the fetus will die in utero of hydrops fatalis, or massive fluid overload and edema. Without any normal alpha globin protein, even hemoglobin F cannot be formed, and the fetus will form an abnormal hemoglobin called BARTS, which consists of four gamma subunits. You can think of hemoglobin BARTS as a greedy Bart Simpson, holding on to oxygen like it's candy bars or burgers or whatever it is Bart likes to eat. He holds on so tightly that no one else, especially the surrounding tissues, can get any oxygen. Now what would you expect from a disease named beta thalassemia? Yep, a mutation in the beta globin gene. While alpha thalassemias are more common in Asia and Africa, which you can remember because both Asia and Africa start with A, beta thalassemia is more common in the Mediterranean populations. Beta thalassemias can be caused by a number of mutations, but the most common are point mutations in the splicing sites and promoter sequences of the beta globin gene. Here there are only two copies of the gene, one from mom and one from dad. And just like alpha thalassemia, the severity of disease is directly proportional to the number of mutations. One mutation, or a heterozygote, is beta thalassemia minor. There is typically still enough functional beta subunits that these patients are relatively asymptomatic. You can confirm this diagnosis with hemoglobin electrophoresis by identifying high concentrations of hemoglobin A2, which consists of two alpha and two beta subunits. This increased hemoglobin A2 replaces some of the normal hemoglobin A that one would normally find in two functioning beta globin genes. The upper limit of normal for hemoglobin A2 is 3.5% of total hemoglobin. Above this, you should suspect a patient of beta thalassemia minor. Two mutations of the beta globin gene, or homozygous mutations, is known as beta thalassemia major. These patients don't have any functional beta globin protein, meaning they cannot make any hemoglobin A. These patients are afflicted with severe anemia, and since these patients have a significant demand for new blood cells, they start using bone marrow outside of the conventional axial skeleton for erythropoiesis. Bone marrow in the skull is one area that is used as a result. The bone marrow expands, and patients develop a typical crew-cut appearance on x-rays, along with chipmunk facies. The treatment is transfusing these patients regularly throughout their life. Unfortunately, this treatment has its own consequences, like iron overload or secondary hemochromatosis, congestive heart failure, and edema, as well as an increased risk for blood-borne pathogens. Why would a patient with beta thalassemia major appear normal for the first few months of life? Well, that's because these patients can make hemoglobin F normally, and so you would not have symptoms until hemoglobin F changes to hemoglobin A after the first few months of life. What would you predict the hemoglobin electrophoresis would show in a patient with beta thalassemia major? Well, there would be no hemoglobin A and increased levels of both hemoglobin A2 and F. Another cause of microcytic hypochromic anemia that we should mention is lead poisoning. We'll discuss lead poisoning in more depth when we talk about hemoglobin synthesis and the porphyrias. For now, just know that lead inhibits two major enzymes involved in making heme, aminolevulinic acid dehydratase and ferrochelatase. What happens without enough heme? Well, you can't make enough hemoglobin, leading to microcytic anemia. Additionally, people with lead poisoning are unable to degrade their RNA, which causes the basophilic stippling from aggregations of ribosomes like we saw earlier. We've discussed to some degree the pathophysiology of lead poisoning, 
But now let's talk about how lead poisoning will present. We've already said that it will present with microcytic anemia, but there are actually a number of other very interesting clinical features. The mnemonic lead may help. The letter L stands for lead lines in the gingiva and long bones. Lead deposits in the gums, long bones, brain, and RBCs. We can see these characteristic lead lines, which are thin gray blue lines along the margin of the gums and teeth. Also, as seen in this x-ray, lead lines can be seen as hyperdense lines in the metaphysis of bones, particularly the long bones. E stands for encephalopathy and erythrocyte basophilic stippling, which we've already discussed. A stands for anemia and abdominal colic. And what would the letter D stand for? Well, D would stand for drop, as in wrist and foot drop. As you may recall from our discussions of toxins and antidotes from pharmacology, lead poisoning is treated with chelating agents, dimercaparol and EDTA. If the patient is a child, treat with succimer. These are all chelating agents that can be used in the treatment of other elemental toxicities as well. Succimer has the advantage of lower toxicity and not causing an increase in the excretion of other essential minerals. To remember that children should get succimer, just remember that it sucks to be a kid who eats lead. Sideroblastic anemia is a rare form of microcytic anemia that also involves heme synthesis enzyme dysfunction and is a hereditary X-linked disorder. Can you recognize the major histologic finding of sideroblastic anemia in this photo? It is a ring sideroblast, as we can see here. A ring sideroblast is basically a cell with iron stuff mitochondria, which are arranged in a ring all around the nucleus of the cell, so they appear like a circle. Heme is synthesized in the mitochondria, and when iron can't complex with protoporphyrin, you get ring sideroblasts. Hereditary conditions, like a mutation in delta aminolevulinic acid synthase, or delta ALA synthase for short, can cause sideroblastic anemia. In this case, you can treat patients with pyridoxine therapy, which you'll note when we discuss hemoglobin synthesis, is used as a cofactor in the delta ALA synthase reaction, and therefore would stimulate greater production of heme. Vitamin B6 is also a cofactor for delta ALA synthase and can be used in treatment. Alcohol, vitamin B6 deficiency, isononiazid, and lead poisoning can alter heme synthesis and are reversible causes of sideroblastic anemia. Alcohol is the most common cause of sideroblastic anemia because alcohol is such a strong mitochondrial poison. Another reason to watch your intake on Friday nights. A mutation in three alpha globin alleles would lead to the abnormal hemoglobin blank, and a mutation in four alpha globin alleles would lead to the abnormal hemoglobin blank. A mutation in three alpha globin alleles would lead to the abnormal hemoglobin H and hemoglobin H disease, and a mutation in four alpha globin alleles would lead to the abnormal hemoglobin BARTS and hydrops fatalis.